Okay, welcome to our New York Giants Preservation Society meeting for today, uh, July 11th, 2024. For all you Long Island people, make sure you get to 7-Eleven before the free Slurpees uh, run out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you like that. Uh, today we have Lou Friedman. Lou is going to be talking about his brand new book on Spite Wilhelm, The Life of a Knuckleball. I know Wilhelm is a Big favorite of all you guys. So before we talk about that, um, next week we will have Eric Dick Ray. He wrote a brand new book called Season of Shattered Dreams, Post-War Baseball, The Spokane Indians, and a Tragic Bus, bus Crash that Changed Everything. And there's a lot of stuff on the New York Giants in there. So he's going to be talking about that. Um, so uh, we will look forward to that. Um, I just got back from San Francisco for the May celebration. There are no words how wonderful that was. Um, if anybody wants to hang around for the post game show, I'll show you some pictures and uh, tell you whoever I spoke to. Um, but we might be making headway with the uh, polo ground signage. We shall see. Don't know. You never know is what I'm going to tell you. Uh, without further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, Lou Friedman. Lou has been on many times about his recent book uh, on Warren Marischal. And he just uh, spoke a couple of months ago to us. So Lou is busy writing. Lou, I hope uh, this continues and uh, there's something else in the, uh, in the barrel for you. But let's all... Uh, Say hi and give a nice round of applause for Lou Friedman. Yep. Lou, welcome Thanks. back. Thanks for having me. Always fun. Thank Although you. I got to say, my current book, I just finished writing a chapter 15 minutes before I signed in. It's on Jack Dempsey and Gene Tunney against the backdrop of the Roaring Twenties. And, and I'm not sure the New York Giants are going to get mentioned. <laughs> Lou, if, Lou, if they're not mentioned, please send me the link anyway when it's done, because I will uh, circulate that. You never know who would like to purchase it, okay? Well, I, you know, they did have a good 20s. So, so you know, they'll get mentioned probably, but, you know, it's really not a baseball book in this case. So, certainly a lot of stuff happened in that decade. <laughs> so, I, I actually met Hoyt Wilhelm once, and... Uh, I went to spring training just one time in the late 70s when I lived in Florida and I was writing for the Jacksonville paper. And as I think back of it, you know, I wasn't there for more than a few days, but I had interviews with Ted Williams, Hoyt Wilhelm, Jim Catt, and, and other guys. I mean, it was one heck of a productive week. And especially with the longevity of the guys. And it was kind of like by accident. If you, you know, who knew they would all be in the Hall of Fame later, you know? Um, so it kind of was kind of neat the way it worked out. And I kind of thought of that uh, when I was doing this, that that was the only time I met him. Um, he was a coach already by then. Although he could still have been pitching in his 60s, probably. <laughs> that was one thing about Hoyt, right? I don't know about you guys, but I always thought he'd be pigeon forever. Yeah. I know they use that phrase for Satchel Page, and he, right? that was his first autobiography or his book, Maybe I'll Pitch Forever. But Hoyt Wilhelm was a guy who you really did think might pitch forever, you know, and, and uh, retired at 49. I kind of also always hoped or wished that he had kicked over and pitched a couple of games in his fifties just for the heck of it. Right. So, but um, that was, so that was the one and only time that I met him face to face. I thought this book would be a little bit easier to write and research than it turned out to be. Um, and that was because uh, he was one of 11 brothers and sisters and it turned out only one sister, the youngest, was still alive. So I, I was able to reach her and talk to her, but I could never reach his kids. They were seemingly invisible at the time, had moved around. And so it became, and then when I started doing the hard research, you figure a guy who's played in the majors has had 
a million newspaper articles written about him. And certainly there were quite a few, but he hardly ever talked about himself. It was, it was strange. The more I got into it, the more I thought, boy, there'd be a lot more to this. If he revealed a little more of his personality, it was like really chipping away at uh, an ice block in that sense of hearing, you know, of finding the tidbits of like him liking to play golf, occasionally going fishing, um, that kind of thing. And he kind of usually said the same thing about the knuckleball, um, that he couldn't even explain why it worked. Having interviewed almost, you know, ten within the last 10 years, almost every living knuckleballer, um, they all feel that way. <laughs> it's I guess it is such a fluke pitch that even if you do well with it, I mean, Phil Necro refused to claim credit as being the best knuckleball pitcher of all time. Uh, and he would say, Hoyt Wilhelm was. Um, Wilhelm would, you know, say other people were. And one thing Phil Necro said that always stuck with me was, you don't, I think I might have, in a question to him, asked, uh, I mean, used the phrase like mastering the knuckleball. And he went, uh-uh, nobody masters the knuckleball. It's like, it runs you. And then, and and Hoyt Wilhelm would say the same thing. So Necro would say Wilhelm was the best knuckleballer. And Wilhelm would say Necro was the best knuckleballer. But certainly Hoyt Wilhelm had a, quite the record to back him up. I mean, I don't know about you guys and how your careers went, but talk about a guy who had to suffer for his art. I mean, think about that. I mean, uh, uh, Wilhelm was almost 30 when he was a rookie because um, nobody would give him a chance. I mean, he had to, World War II was an interruption, and but he had pitched a couple of times, in, you know, in locally and in the low minors in North Carolina. And when he comes out of the military, nobody's looking at him at all. And he still has to go back and start all over again at, you know, some low-level team in North Carolina near where he grew up. And it took forever to get noticed, to get accepted, to get a chance. And who gave him the chance? All your giants, <laughs> right? <laughs> The uh, and even Leo DeRocher, who he became his champion in the beginning, uh, his rookie year, he was skeptical. You know when he finally got to spring training, and uh, Bill Rigney, I guess we, we all know as later, uh, you know, next generation manager when he was a coach, was uh, Wilhelm's champion in spring training, and you know basically convinced DeRocher he could help the team, and. And if you think back about it, you know, Wilhelm had an incredible rookie year after everybody ignored him. And he's already, you know, been ignored by everybody in the majors. And he comes out and his rookie year, I've got his stats right here. He has a great year. I mean, he goes 15 and three, leads the National League in earn run average as a rookie at 243. Is a game, you know, in a time when, um, not too many people are using many relievers. He pitches in 71 games and he finishes 32. And all of a sudden he goes from being a nobody to somebody people care about and they can't believe it. Even if they never, it seems like, you know, following his career, listening to him, you know, reading his words over the years and in interviews city by city, it seemed like he never quite had much faith from his managers, um, even when he had his track record. Um, they just did not trust the knuckleball. I mean, that seems to be the history of the knuckleball. Um, no matter, even if you're good at it, and even if you succeed at it, no. But since nobody can explain it, it seems like the managers who want and need to rely on him are still skeptical and it's happened time after time and that's why he was you could say he was a star three different times probably 
with the Giants first, with the Orioles and the White Sox. I mean, then he was hanging on, you know, at the end, but still. Um, but each, almost every time, Paul Richards with the Orioles, and you and a lot of you guys are old enough to remember Paul Richards, even as a manager at least, was probably Wilhelm's truest believer. You know, he was the guy, um, you know, who felt he could always get the job done. And he had seen the numbers. I think right, Richards was a little bit of ahead of his time when it came to analytics. Uh, even I don't think they used the word, but I think he was a believer in that kind of stuff at a time when nobody paid any attention to it, you know, in the late 50s. And, um, and he figured, well, if this guy can get people out, I want him on my side. And that was enough for him. And you can uh, uh, certainly the older guys in the group, like myself, um, obviously remember the oversized glove with the Orioles. You guys remember that the uh, the giant catcher's mitt <laughs> that the Orioles tried and uh, to supposedly make it easier to catch Wilhelm's unpredictable knuckleball. But I don't think there was a player or a person in baseball who hated the oversized glove as much as Gus Triandos, his catcher. Uh, Triandos, time after time, talked about, well, it was interesting to catch Wilhelm, but I never knew what was going to happen, and the glove didn't help me, the big glove. And um, and he just seemed to – He I, I didn't – I think it was probably the best day of his life when he got traded. <laughs> so as good a hitter as he was, and he was an all-star catcher two or three times, I think, but he just couldn't stand coping with the knuckleball and the way it made him feel. And it gave him this edgy feeling like he couldn't do his job because his job was to catch the ball, call the pitches, and not have the ball roll to the backstop. As uh, Bob Euchre famously said, that was the best way to field an echo ball. You you put the glove down, you get the catcher's stance, and then after the ball goes by you and rolls to the backstop, the best way to catch it is just to pick it up after it stops rolling. So <laughs> something exactly like what you would think Bob Euchre would say. <laughs> so but probably, I guess, my favorite knuckleball quote. And um, it's... Uh, but Triandos was never making jokes about it. <laughs> he just suffered, you know, and and he was such a good player otherwise, you know. He was, you know, like a 275 hitter with 20 homers, and, and he was popular in Baltimore. And Hoyt Wilhelm drove him nuts. That's really what, what the unfortunate flip side was. He just drove him crazy. Um, and then, but, you know, what an emergence when you think back to Hoyt Wilhelm joining the Giants. They expected nothing when he came to spring training in 1952. I mean, he finally works his way through all kinds of low-level stops in the minors, and somebody's giving him attention. I think at the time, his birthday got mixed up uh, somewhere along the way. And at that, for a long time, he was said to be a year older than he was. And um, even his sister uh, said she was aware that it got mix, mixed up, but she did not know how or why. And it really didn't get clarified. So if you look at baseball reference right now, it says he was a 29-year-old rookie. And for years, I think it said he was a 30-year-old rookie. Uh, and she said she had no idea what was behind it. I never could find anything in writing other than the point being that nobody ever asked him how old he really was. He didn't let, go around lying to the sports writers. He just didn't volunteer the information about his age until one day um, it was near his birthday and he was chatting with the sports writer and uh, the guy point blank said, you know, what are you, 33 or 35, whatever it was. And and and, and Hoyt says, oh, that's in my rearview mirror or something like that. And so that's when it fi first came out that 
he wasn't the age they listed him at. And then it didn't really come out officially and get changed till later, I think, when he retired. So, which means he could have made it to 50 <laughs> if he tried a little bit harder. Actually, he tried about as hard as he could to hang on. So, I don't know. Um, you know, that um, you, you got to love the knuckleball for the stories of longevity that it produced for certain guys. I mean, you know, uh, Phil Necro was almost as old as Wilhelm. I mean, Tim Wakefield was well into his 40s. Um, guys like that who were able to keep going, who didn't never threw 100 miles an hour, so never put the torque on their arms and never got into arm trouble. And then you have the sad story of Wilbur Wood, who was a good friend of Hoyt Wilhelm's, and was one of my favorite interviews with about Hoyt being a teammate of his, um, where unfortunately for Hoyt, for Wilbur Wood, who thought he would pitch for till he was 50, he gets KO'd by a line drive to his knee. I mean, that's what ended his career. I mean, uh, Ron LaFleur, the old Detroit Tiger, hit a line drive off his knee and broke his kneecap. And, Ooh. you know, that time and that led to the end of his career. He was out for a full year, made a comeback, thought he was going to be okay, and never was again. And he did retire younger than that. But uh, Wood was. Oh, no. Very good at dispelling some of the myths about the material that's out there about Wood. It's obvious what he says is true. He says Hoyt Wilhelm did not teach him the knuckleball. He knew the knuckleball from the time he was about 12. He said Wilhelm gave him tips that helped improve the way he threw the knuckleball. But, um, you know, Will, uh, Wood, Wood was a high school phenomenon in the Boston area. You know, he's a multi sport star. I think he played hockey too from Belmont, Massachusetts. And, um, but he, you know, he, he was a guy who was drafted high. The Red Sox, I think, gave him three years of chances where he never won a game when he was brought up. And they finally shipped him to the Pirates, and he was striking out, so to speak, with the Pirates. And he was going to retire. And he talked to his wife and said, I think I'll give it one more chance. And... He came back and relied on the knuckleball, and all of a sudden he was winning 20 games every year. So that was one guy whose career was the stereotype of having his career saved by the knuckler. And um, he, but he enjoyed being a teammate with Wilhelm. He said he was a really good guy. Tommy John, that story uh, was one of my favorite stories to listen to when he was a he was a teammate of Wilhelm's and. He said that, and they played golf together and went fishing together in the central Florida area, the Tampa, general Tampa Bay area where they both lived. I think, I think John still lives in Sarasota. Um, but, um, of course, we all know about Tommy John's surgery, which made Tommy John famous outside the sport of baseball. And I talk to people a lot who don't know anything about baseball, but they know what Tommy John surgery is. <laughs> it always cracks me up when I hear that. And I said, do you know who that guy is? And they said, no, it's a, it's an arm procedure or something. But John, you know, saying that he um, was going to give his own comeback a couple of years. And if it didn't work out where he could come back and have his usual stuff, he planned to go hang out with Hoyt Wilhelm for an an entire spring training and make him teach him the knuckleball. But he never needed to do that because John was able to make his full healthy recovery. But that would have been something that I probably would have ended, uh, added greatly to the knuckleball legend if Tommy John's surgery produced another knuckleball. But it never came to that because John pitched just as many years, if not more, with his regular stuff before. Um, you know, when he came back, then he did this a knuckle iron. I see, Gary, some people are raising their hands for questions. You know, I can never figure out how to work that on my computer. Well, we're going we're gonna to go to the questions after you finish your presentation. Yeah, I mean, any, I can do it any time. I'll be happy to just chat, too. 
with anything. So, you know, we got Ray Wilhelm, you know, not the relief pitcher goes to the Hall of Fame after people never thought much of relief pitchers, you know, for decades. Although um, I was just reading a book about New York baseball called The New York Game by Kevin Baker, which has a lot of giants in his. I'm reading dumb. that book. Very good. I just yeah, finished it the day before yesterday. But it refers to John McGraw as really being the first guy to ever take relief pitchers seriously. Um, you know, he, he didn't use relief pitchers the way they're used now, but at least he counted on them, you know, when nobody else was doing that. And, um, and it talks about that. It was kind of a nice uh, side touch to the whole story there. Um but, uh, you know, and then you go decades before you get serious guys and before anybody talks about a save and and all that. But I mean, so so Wilhelm really becomes the first true knuckleball relief pitcher star <laughs> and uh, and gets into the Hall of Fame. Something. I mean, what were the odds against that happening after he doesn't become a rookie until he's like 29 or 30 years old in the early 50s? And What's that? Did somebody? There's a. Uh, give me a second, Lou, because what's going on lately is that participants. It's there in a bad way. I, mean, I don't know dead. what. I don't see it's that. There in the terrible section. Can we please, Howard, you please? People should come out and say they want Howard, you please. I can't. He's not even here on the screen. My apologies. There he is. Mute. Good. Steve will like that. Go ahead, Lou. Yep. But anyway, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to talk. It's, we've been talking for 20 minutes, and I see a lot of hands raised. So I'll yeah, be happy why, to why, why don't we start with me? So what's the best way to get your brand new book? Uh, well, McFarland Publishing, they do all those baseball books. That's the way to do it. And Amazon, I'm sure, is a, Amazon being as comprehensive as they possibly can, where you can buy an electric razor or a baseball book. You know, they're not fussy. <laughs> so. all right, I, I, I'm going to ask you a few questions. By the way, the other book uh, was Tales from the Clubhouse. I mentioned. And that had, and you know, that had a Willie Mays chapter in it. That's and I, I kind of rewrote that for my newspaper when Willie died. I just kind of condensed it and put the two of them together just to have something in the paper when he passed away. Why Why? why did you choose Wilhelm as your subject? Um, I just thought he'd been such an interesting character in the game for a long time. And, you know, the struggles he had early. I knew he was a really late in life rookie, so to speak. And I had written so much about the knuckleball that still intrigued me. Um, and and so, so those are the two things that set it apart in the beginning. And then I, of course, he was, um, you know, when I was growing up, he was pitching with the Orioles and the White Sox. So I may have um, been born only a year before his rookie year. So I didn't follow him with the Giants, but I certainly followed him regularly with the Orioles and the White Sox. So without without the knuckleball, his, his career probably would have been over, correct? He just couldn't get anybody. Well, you know, he threw it when he was young, and but everybody hated it <laughs> and they wouldn't pay attention to him. I mean, you know, so most of those guys, well, of course, they weren't throwing 100 miles an hour anyway at that point. But those guys, you know, there's so many guys who had fastballs, and that's what they wanted. The scouts, the managers, the coaches, they wanted to see the heat. Not much different like then today. All right, Steve Rothschild, you're up. Hi, Lou. I just want to re-mention what I said earlier. There's only a couple of people here. That Hoyt Wilhelm was the last World War II veteran still playing baseball, kind of towards the end of his career. My question for you is, um, this came up yesterday. I was at a lecture about baseball movies, and somehow, I forget which movie it was that Hoyt Wilhelm was in, but it wasn't him. Um, the guy from the, the announcer for the D backs, the uh, knuckleball pitcher, Candiotti, played Hoyt. Oh, Candiotti, yeah. Right. Hoyt Wilhelm had an interesting posture. I don't know if there was something wrong with him, 
he always leaned one way. He had the hat the other way. Did you know anything about that? Was there some kind of an ailment? It didn't affect his pitching, but he was never, never stood up straight. Look at his baseball cards. Look at him as a, in a yearbook or what it was always like leaning a little bit. You know, you got me on that one. Okay. I'm I, glad I, I got you. I can't say, yeah, no, I can't say I, I know anything about that or heard anybody talk about it. And Maybe somebody I mean, on the, on the zoom knows, I don't know. Arby, do you remember the, his look? I mean, he was like leaning to the side when he, when he was just standing there. I don't know. If yeah. we don't, that's okay. Thank you. For I, I don't, He's standing you asked me a question. And... The answer is yes. I remember that too. He was, his, yeah. It's to his head was cocked all the to the side all the time, and the hat was askew as well. That's right. You're standing up straight on the cover picture of the book. Okay. <laughs> if you look at it, and if Gary holds it up again, you can see he is straight up and down. Maybe it was during uh, the pitching motion that Steve's talking about. No, no, no. It was a lot. Of, that was his. In fact, uh, when Candiati played his part, he ended up learning how to do that. It, it wasn't intentional. I just think it was part of his posture. I don't know. But it's not important. Thank you for coming yeah. on. Thank yeah. you, Stephen. Thanks. Mr. Clink. Uh, thank you very much. Um, a most interesting character, I think, Hoyt Wilhelm is. Um, I, I wanted to hit a couple of points about him, one of a real close personal nature. His first three years were pitched in Mooresville, North Carolina, and a lot of people here don't even know where North Mooresville, North Carolina is. I right do. That's uh, where he grew up. Uh, yeah, he grew. He was born in Huntersville and actually grew up in Cornelia. It's all in the same county in Carolina. My son lives there in uh, in Huntersville. Uh, you don't know if that park is still there, do you, where he pitched? No, I do know that county has mushroomed in population it's booming from the time that he was a young per, uh, young person there and they had farmland and i mean the population of the county i looked it up you know compared to what it was like you know in the 30s and it's just way way bigger it's like uh the outskirts of charlotte yeah it's it's, yeah, a, it's like a, a suburb town for charlotte really but yeah you know, I, I looked at his record in mooresville uh he won forty. Uh, he won fifty-one games in three years, uh, and you know I don't know how they overlooked him. The first six years, he won ninety-six games and lost fifty. That's an awfully good record. I, I, he was completely overlooked. At, at, at the way, the only thing I ever could find that he said about it was people held the knuckleball against him because his record was great. Was Before he for the war and after the war both? Yeah, was he throwing the knuckleball from yes. the beginning there in Mooresville? Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Said I, that I was, he said that nobody understood it. Nobody, you know, they and that was what slowed him down. But I've he, got, he couldn't yeah. believe that. Yeah. This looks is like a, a very who, old media guy. <laughs> yeah. This is who's who in baseball. Uh ah. who's who in, in the American Association. And that's point there. Uh, now, it lists his birthday so we can get the record straight once and for all here. It yeah. listed here as July 23rd, 1925. No? Let's see. 22. Yeah, what? there was a few different years. I'm looking for a sheet on the Wikipedia or whatever, what they're calling it now, or baseball reference. But okay. it did change. It did change over time. Boy, I mean... Uh, you know, uh, Satchel Page has nothing on this guy, I'll tell you. Pretty uh, much. You know, I mean, for changing years or whatever. The um, funny part was that Satchel Page always talked about it and joked yeah. about it. And Hoyt Wilhelm never talked about it. He was that was the weird part. He was a kind of taciturn guy, I'm sure. I yeah. did want to ask you one thing, and I don't know if Triandos was a catcher. But, you know, the first time I ever saw Triandos, excuse me, Triandos, the first time I ever saw Wilhelm pitch, is maybe for many of you the first time. We didn't have televised games out in the Bay Area, uh, mm -hmm. but we did have the the 154th game in 1961. And they brought him in. Uh, I think Maris had come within one of, of, of tying it in, in regu per regulation time per Ford Frick. But anyhow, oh, okay. what what Richards or whoever the manager, they brought him in in the eighth inning, and uh, 
I don't know what Triando's thought of that, but I know, uh, you know, the Yankees. Oh, come on. Give us a shot. You know, let the guy, let Maris hit a fastball at least. No, no. They, they brought him in to, to throw the knuckleball to stop it. You know, and I mean, that's baseball. That's what you're going to do on it. Uh, they didn't and, change catchers. Did you look up the box score? Did they change no, catchers? I, I'm not sure if they did. I, I, I just, <laughs> that's actually, that was related in, uh, I think, that might have been actually in the movie 61 they talked okay. about. I think yeah. that's where I picked it up is in 61. But uh, actually, Earl Robinson, one of the, uh, I think he was one of the, the first or second blacks to ever play for the Orioles, actually caught the fly ball. And that fly ball, you know, if, you know, this is what they said in 61, the wind was blowing, but unfortunately the wind was blowing in and mm -hmm. it held up the ball. And the Yankees thought, oh, you know, he hit it to right. It's gone. It's going. Oh, no, nope, held up. And Earl Robinson snared the ball. And, you know, at least I got to see the game. And, again, not many of us on the West Coast ever saw East Coast games. Huh. Because they didn't do that kind of stuff. Um, was there ever a catcher that said they liked the challenge of catching him? Did you ever? Yeah, there was, um, there was a TV show. When and and Wilhelm was very brief, it's in the book, but uh, he very briefly pitched for the Indians and they made one of those. Um, it was a weekly TV show and it had it's still on, um, you can find it on a computer. Um, uh, uh, the the tape of the show, it's sort of and it was instruction on how to throw and catch the knuckleball, but it was a backup Indians catcher who was not well known and not well remembered um but but you can watch that and it's entertaining to the especially given that it happened to come out when during the short period he was with the indians between you know his shifts around there and that young catcher i think that young catcher was just happy to be there you know? i don't think he was you know, you know and still with the team you know so it, I mean, he might have been one of those catchers but i, I, I can't didn't see you. anybody love the glove either yeah I can't let you go without commenting about Wilbur Wood. Uh, I know, love Wilbur. Wilbur Wood. Now, you know, all we ever hear about changing from being a starter to being a reliever, I'm tired of hearing about Eckersley because Wilbur Wood outdid him by a mile. If you look up his career, he went from a 20-game winner as a starter the next year. Nothing. We don't. No, nothing in between. The next year, the guy led the league in saves. He turned it around in one year. I mean, I'm not touting Wilbur Wood for the Hall of Fame, but I'm saying that the guy really. Uh, if you want to, he's the poster boy for changing from being a starter to being a reliever. Not not Eckersley. Eckersley well, wasn't know, really that what good. What I like more about Wilbur, though, if you just look at his innings pitched. Yeah. I mean, he, it's in the book too, I think. He pitched 376 and two thirds innings, which was one third of an inning more than I think Jack Morris it was. But that's the most innings, which of course no one's going to top now. Um, but I believe since Walter Johnson in 1912 or something. Goodness. Yeah. I mean, and he was doing that each year. That's why it was so bad and so sad when he had that his career yeah. cut short with a broken knee. He would have kept doing that for like five more years where he was winning 20 games a year, pitching 300 innings. I mean, who knows where he might have ended up in the Hall of Fame with yeah. that kind of a turnaround, you know. Yeah. But he had four or five years like that, which were just ridiculous for just, especially now, yeah. you know. I mean, what's the most? Who's going to lead the league in innings this year? What is it going to be? Two, two hundred, two ten, maybe. Yeah, three hundred and seventy-five. No. <laughs> so. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Steve, do you want to just interject with that birthday? Yeah, I saw it, uh, July twenty-six, two thousand uh, nineteen twenty-two, is Wilhelm. That's what I found. I thought it was twenty-three, but it was certainly. It wasn't 1925. It was one of those. It was 23 at one point and everything you would look up. Really? I mean, it would, it shifted around for a while. I well, mean, I would count, I would believe baseball reference now. Yeah. But okay. But, no, but no. during his playing days, you know, it might be anything. <laughs> it might have right. been 
there might have been a 25 in there at some point by Maybe. accident. So, yeah. Maybe. Mr. Uh, Weber, you're up. Well, I would think that Wilhelm's birthday is a moving target. He either was 100 or is 100 right now. So, uh, what's your yeah, it email? It crossed my mind when I, was writing, when I was writing the book that, yeah, we had hit a century either way. <laughs> You know what is your email? What is your email address, Lou? Yes, L L Friedman. Yes, F R E E D M A N number fifty one yes. at gmail yes. dot com. Okay, so just L Friedman fifty one at gmail dot com. Did uh, in in uh, talking about Triandos, who I I watched him catch uh, Wilhelm. I remember as a young kid doing that, and it was really kind of funny to watch a catcher who was so intent and so really zeroed in on the on the the pitch that's coming the guy could either be digging a hole with the with the animals you know a ground squirrel or jumping out of his <laughs> knees to catch the ball because it was sailing on him that had to drive the guy absolutely crazy did he ever tell you any story did you did you know triandos no 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 he was passed he oh, had okay. passed away by that time so i was reading i read a lot about him and i read okay. a lot of his comments but it was actually it was pretty much the same comment with a different variation about how uh, really, how it drove them nuts. You know? Maybe, maybe a tough one to answer. Anybody, uh, anyone with uh, funny stories about Triandos, uh, about uh, Wilhelm, and how he threw it, and how he did it, and how well he played, or anything like that. Maybe I, I don't know that uh, of, might be a tough. But go ahead. I was just saying, in terms of what, and in terms of uh, Wilhelm, anything, you, know, you know how he yeah. played the game, or you know. He was a dead serious guy who was very consistent. Uh -huh. That's how I read him as in his career. And I didn't, that's the kind of anecdotes I was dredging for and didn't find a tremendous number of them. But um, it was, um, he, he was passionate about the game and he, he had that stick to itiveness that he needed to keep going. Like we were talking about with uh, North Carolina, you know, winning so well in North Carolina and not getting any attention at all and not getting noticed. Um, you know, he, he talked about it later being frustrated, you know, but when you're trying to fight your way up, you don't complain. You're just trying to get everybody's attention. Sign me, sign me. <laughs> Great presentation, Lou. Thank you. Great. Thank you, fellow Alaskan. Uh, Ken Kelly, <laughs> you're up. Ken, unmute, Ken. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. All right. Uh, Mr. Friedman, a fellow knuckleballer here. Uh, through the knuckleball, I started learning the knuckleball from my dad at age 12. Ah. Threw it in Babe Ruth League, threw it in high school, and threw it one year in college and played senior league baseball through it then. Transitioned from baseball to softball, started warming up with the softball, throwing the knuckleball, and all of a sudden the guys didn't want to play catch with me anymore. <laughs> so, ah. You, th you think it moves when it's in a baseball, you ought to try it with a softball sometimes. I've not heard that, but I'm, yeah. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would throw the, I would throw a knuckleball with a softball, <laughs> warm it up for games, and they would say, nope, not going to catch you anymore. You may recognize this book. Yep. Uh, I've got that one, and I've, I've read through it several times. Uh, I'll tell I like you, your hat. I like your hat. Yeah, I was at, I was at uh, Rickwood Field during the, the games uh, a couple of weeks right. ago in Alabama. That's where I'm from. Okay. But uh, – a story that I wanted to relate to y'all was uh, about Charlie Huff, which I know is in this book that I just showed. Uh, Tom House, who's a good friend of mine, who was a pitching coach with the Texas Rangers, we got to talking one day at Chili's when I met him, and he just asked me a question. He says, who do you think on our staff has the best mechanics? And I was throwing out all Bobby Witt. I was throwing out Kevin Brown. I was throwing out all these players. He says, no, Charlie Huff. Huh. He says 99 out of 100 times his foot landed in the same spot on the mound. Wow. And, and of course, you know, Charlie throwing the knuckleball and everything. But uh, I just wanted to kind of share that. I'm a southpaw, so I threw a left-handed knuckleball. And I am now teaching my 14-year-old grandson to throw that knuckleball because I don't want that ever pitch to ever go away. And I think the best uh, strikeout game I had was my 14 – I was 14 years old in Babe Ruth. And I had 17 strikeouts one night throwing that knuckleball. 
and my a night dad, to remember. Yeah, and my dad went out and bought that old flimsy, flexible, big old mitt for Ray Timms, who's my who was my catcher, and he ended up being a pretty good catcher. Of course, it was OJT on the job training, trying to catch that thing the first year or so, but he got pretty proficient at it by the time we made it to 15 years of age after our last year before we went into high school. So I really appreciate the book. It was really enlightening. Uh, the physics and the aerodynamics of seeing that pitch move like it does still fascinates me, even though I did, I, I've thrown it for 50 years or more. I read somewhere there is a guy in the majors this year who's throwing a knuckler. That's be the first time in three or four years. Yeah. I never heard of the guy, but I, I saw a passing reference to it. And I went, yay. <laughs> well, it, it, it's such a great pitch. Like I said, my dad taught it to me, and, and I used it all the way through my high school career and one year of college before injuries took their toll on me. But uh, it's just a neat pitch to throw and, and see what it does, especially when you're throwing it with a softball. <laughs> well, I, I have not heard about a softball, but that would be fascinating to yeah. see. Yeah. I, I will say that in, in the book, too, Wilhelm was, a, was coaching – he did not want to teach the knuckleball. Really? Okay. That's what he was saying. I think he was in spring training minor league camp when I saw him. I was somewhere in the Tampa area because yeah. I moved around that trip to right. those kinds of places. So I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember who he was with at that moment. But he said he didn't want to teach it. Yeah. I knew in your book that I read at the beginning that they were trying to decide who created the knuckleball. And you had like two yes. or three different individuals yeah. that. That, that you did research on. And I really didn't get a good handle on who actually started throwing that. Knuckle. I don't think they have. Okay. I mean, but I did, I was fascinated by the fact that Eddie Seacott was involved. Yes. You know, the, probably what, one of the worst baseball criminals you could say <laughs> of all time. And, but you know, when he threw his career away, he had an unbelievable record and earned run average. And if it became known later and he was given credit for the knuckle, he would certainly have been in the Hall of Fame. You know, his record was that good. You know, instead he's banned from baseball and a, and a dirty word, his name, you know, from the Black Sox scandal. But yeah, yeah. but so just kind of having him thrown in there as somebody who kind of did something positive <laughs> is the way it came across was kind of fascinating too. Well, I want to let you know it was a, it was a great read to, to see you. the history and see the, some of the Major it was as much fun that, as I've had. That's Phil Necro's hand on the cover. Yeah, matter of fact, I just got Phil Necro's <laughs> book in signed by him. I'll be reading it next. So yeah, we were that was take that photo was taken at the minor league ballpark in the suburbs of Atlanta. Yeah. Um, where he had, was throwing batting practice still. <laughs> people people don't yeah, people don't realize how important the nails were. I threw with two fingers. Uh, I've seen three, I've seen four, but I I, I, I was always a two finger knuckleballer. But I uh, always had to keep the nails the right length. And, and yeah, I bet. And, and, and can uh, you show us? Can you can show, show us with a ball? Uh, I don't have a baseball with me. Uh, our, I, I just our, use I use these two fingers here, and I would push off with a stiff wrist. And I also learned how to throw a knuckle curve, so I'd let my wrist roll a little bit. If I had the wind behind me, I would throw more knuckle curves. If I had the wind blowing in front of me, I threw more floaters. Uh, and I would move the ball around. I'd move my fingers around the seams to see, you know, what movement the ball would do. I experimented all the time with my knuckleball. Ah. Ken, you're the most interesting guy we've ever had as a questioner. Really? I mean, I, I, it's... Is, is, is the I have to ask you, Ken, is the vanity plate on your car knuckler? It should be. No, <laughs> no, no, but everybody calls me from Alabama and I still get emails and texts from my buddies. My nickname was Nuxy. That's yeah, what okay. be on your yeah, plate. The, yeah. Well, I've got I've got Auburn plates, so you know. Oh Lou, yeah. uh in your in your uh, the book that Ken is talking, and Ken evidently is a heralded uh southpaw. Were there any knuckleballers who uh, played in the majors as pitchers? Pardon me? Were there any left-handed knuckleball throwers? Oh, look. I haven't thought much about that. I mean, some of those old guys, I can't even remember. Was Candy Audi left-handed or was he right-handed? Right-handed. He was right-handed. He was right-handed, right yeah. okay. Um, I've, never know, never, seen, I've, never I've never seen it. I never thought about that that way. Yeah. I've never yeah. seen a southpaw knuckleballer. That must have been. <laughs> Now we're going to have to all look it up. But, <laughs> but it's, it, it seems like it, it had to have been, right? 
Uh, uh, Bill, you're up. Go ahead, Bill. Friedman, I enjoy your presentation. I wanted to mention two things. Uh, I had a relative who was like a Yankee hater, and he used to tell me once in a while he heard on the radio when Hoy Wilhelm pitched a no-hitter against the Yankees in Baltimore. I think it was in 1958. I think you're right. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is that um, my friends and I, when we used to get together sometimes and come up with trivia questions, one of the trivia questions was, who's the only Hall of Famer to hit a home run in his first at bat? Yeah. Never again that's why wilhelm <laughs> that was right there's a guy i know who works at the hall of fame in cooperstown he uh -huh. uses that as a trivia question all the time he told me yeah he exactly. says whenever he makes talks he uses it a lot so oh, i know thank you very much thank you bill i, I thought that was pretty funny yes definitely mr uh ed freer you're up yes hi I, I just wanted to show you one thing before i answer my question with regard to your next book, this is a menu from Jack Dempsey's oh, yeah. restaurant. Oh, yeah, And, you know, I used to walk by it on the way to the old garden for Rangers games. And I, I'm, I'm, okay. I think one time I saw him sitting on the front, uh, you know, looking out at the traffic. So You probably just did say, because he was always there at a yeah, certain age. There. You could see him sitting there. Yeah. And a I, sea trout I, dinner. Did you the eat there? Did you eat there? No, I was 16, you know, this is more yeah, of a bar. They, they were pretty place. well known for their cheesecake. <laughs> yeah, well, they had sea trout on the menu this day <laughs> for 60 cents, a sea trout dinner. Yeah, well, yeah. I've Turkey seen a menu uh, not so long ago at the Boxing Hall of Fame. They have a menu, and I took yeah, a picture of it. I took a picture quite, of the menu. It's quite a restaurant, and it was pretty famous at the time. Oh, and My, he was... Somebody, too, when I was doing some research for this book that I'm working on, one of the things that we talked about is that even though Tony beat him both times, Dempsey kind of endures in the public eye more <laughs> as a popular figure. And one of the reasons we talked about it is the restaurant. Yeah. Well, because he, he was just there. Like and, a he nice was so, and he was, yeah, and he was accessible to the public for years later. Yeah. Whereas Tony became somewhat reclusive um, I ate at the restaurant once when I was about 20, I think, on a visit there. I have an aunt who's 100 years old right now, actually, and she hasn't moved out of her rent-controlled apartment since like 1956. Wow. And, and, uh, but it was one of my visits to see her. I actually went into Jack Dempsey's uh, in the waning days, because I think I looked it up and it went out of business in 71. Or something like that, but uh, but I did eat there one time. <laughs> yeah, they even had a, he, a whole and he band. wasn't there. He was not there. Yeah. the uh, The question I was going to ask is: our, our our family knew Wes Westrom, and I know you talked more about Gus Triandos, right? But from what I remember about uh, Wes, he his hands got terribly gnarled from catching the knuckleball. Was do you hear anything about that? Or well, I don't remember the hands part. Is I don't think he was one of the complainers. No, he didn't I think, complain. I but... think I think he when oh, he dude. did play, and I think they did use him. I think he was one of the guys they put in, and used <laughs> a little more often because he could handle it better. And that's mm -hmm. if I'm remembering correctly from the <laughs> research. But my impression was he did he gave them a favorable impression to you know to Rocher and to those guys as a guy who could catch it. So the, the, the last question it just has to do with relievers. And you may or may not know when did they stop the fireman reward? Because now they seem to only find relievers to lose the game. That's a good question. Say. I remember when that was a regular thing, and then Rolades. You remember that they used to sponsor yeah. because of the relief you know, oh, yeah. we give you in your stomach. <laughs> and then yeah, it did go away, and I don't know. I don't remember it when it faded out. Probably, I, mean, I was they, probably living in Alaska and I wasn't on his in touch. <laughs> but you know, sometimes these managers just bring a reliever in to finally blow up the game. <laughs> well, now it seems that way. I mean, you know, just let them I remember I, I'm always complaining about that. There was about two weeks ago, there were two days in a row where some guy was pitching a one hit shutout and they took him out after seven. You know, that kind of an incomplete game, you know, that drives the purists crazy. So, well, thank you. Thank you for the memories with Jack Dempsey, too. 
Hey, yeah, thank you. And I'll tell you, let me give you a Jack Dempsey story. This is a great one. There's a guy I know. I, I was a boxing writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer during one of the last great heydays, 79 and the 80s. And the local boxing promoter who is in the Hall of Fame is a guy named Russell Peltz. And I talked to Russell about his memories of Jack Dempsey and all this just a, a month ago or so. And he said, and Russell grew up in the Philadelphia suburbs. And as a 15 year old, they had a field trip to New York City. And Russell was a boxing fan, even as a teenager. And he lobbied for them to eat at Jack Dempsey's because they hadn't picked where they're going to eat lunch. So they did. The guy was easily malleable and they all went in. Him and his class went into Jack Dempsey's restaurant and Jack Dempsey was there. And he had his uh -oh. picture taken with Jack Dempsey as a 15 year old with one of those cheesy things where the fist is like this, you know, <laughs> Dempsey on his face and him on Dempsey's face. He still has it framed, which is like 60 years later. Russell's like in his like 77 now. So he still has it framed from that little lunch visit at Dempsey's restaurant, which I thought was a wonderful story. Yes. I, yes. It's, too late I for, same... it's too late for us to go. Yeah, but I had the same uh, picture with Joe Frazier once. Oh, that's, that's another. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I had my another... moments. I had my moments with Joe when I was covering boxing. He made that yeah, comeback. Yeah, when I he was in a receiving have... one, and everybody else he shook hands with, but when they got to me, he put his fists up. <laughs> that's great. And you got the picture? No. Oh, oh it was oh. before. Well, okay. well before if, uh, right. you had to carry your coat Well, out. Russell's thing, I don't know what they took the picture with, but it wasn't a phone. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you, Ed. Harvey right. Weinberg. Um, Lou, a fabulous presentation, and I love the boxing stories. I'm not a boxing fan. That's why I really enjoy those stories. Um, I got a weird comment. I actually saw Hoyt Wilhelm pitch for the New York Giants on July 10th, 1954, but I have no recollection of it. I was going to say, I, how old were you, two? Eight. Okay. I'm 78. You could do the arithmetic. Okay. Yesterday was the anniversary. I looked up the box score. I, I have vivid recollections of Willie Mays, which I've, I've espoused many times on these Zoom meetings. But... What I I have I had a, a vague recollection of hearing the name Hoyt Wilhelm. So I looked up the box score. Hoyt was the the Giants lost 10 7 that day to the Pirates. Hoyt pitched one and two thirds innings, four hits, three runs, three earned runs, two walks, three strikeouts. He got the loss. His record was eight and three after the loss. Now, the box score, which I'm sure is brought up to date, because I don't remember this being a stat, was his second blown save. And it's just weird that well, I... It would I, have been, yeah. You're yeah. right, it would have been brought up to date later. Yeah, because that wasn't a stat. The no. other interesting thing is the pitcher who started that game and was worse than mm -hmm. Hoyt Wilhelm, he gave up five hits, four runs, four earned runs, was Don Little. Of course, he threw the pitch to Vic Wirtz. Yeah. And then right. came up with the. There you go. Willie made the catch and the throw. And then when uh, DeRosha took Little out of the game, Little flipped the ball to, I guess, I think it was Marv Grissom who, re, who I, relieved him. I remember right? this. Yeah. And he said, Well, I got my guy. I did my job, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got Thanks, him out. Luke. Got yeah, I got my guy. It, yeah. You know, I don't think, uh, I don't think Hoyt got into the Hall of Fame based on the. Uh, Game you saw. <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Lou. Thank you. Hey, look who's here. My roommate. That room looks familiar. Norm called. <laughs> hey, um, this has been very enjoyable, Lou. I don't have any questions, but I have four comments based on questions that came up. Um, one is, if you check the pictures of Hoyt Wilhelm, his posture is just fine. It's just his head is tilted. I meant uh, the second one is Tom Candiotti played Hoyt Wilhelm in the movie 61. Right. And then the third one is Matt Waldron is knuckleball pitcher for the Padres. The, one, the guy this year? Yeah, yes. and last year too. He's Okay. 
And the last one is I'm shocked with this group, but the first person that came to mind is a lefty knuckleball pitcher. A Wilbur Wood, yeah. Yeah, Wilbur Wood. Yeah, what's wrong with Oh, yeah, Wilbur was, yeah, obviously was a southpaw. And that's it. I'm done. Thank you, Lou. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I'm glad to hear, remind me on the name of the current guy. Thanks. It's Matt Waldron. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Lou, I got one question, I guess, the to wrap it up, I assume this pitch it must be so hard to control uh, because with the rash of injuries by all these fireballers, wouldn't more pitchers want to learn how to throw it? You know, that seemed to be the trend in the past. You know, but even then, you know, one of the things that seemed to be a common common comment was, from guys was, it's just, it's harder to just pick up than people think, and they were much better off if they learned it earlier in their life, even if they didn't rely on it. And that was one of those contradictions that Wood had, because people would say that Wilhelm taught him the knuckleball, and that wasn't true. He had actually learned it much younger, but he didn't use it in high school, and he went back to it. Um, and I, so that seems to be one of the opinions of. A successful knuckleballers that you know the earlier you learn it learn it and use it but of course nobody wants to then because they want to rely on their fastball you know to get noticed right otherwise they'll all be the second coming of right wilhelm when most got wants to look at them all right lou uh again the new book amazon and what the publisher again i'm sorry nebraska mcfarland mcfarland i'm sorry right press Let's all give it up for Lou Friedman. Thanks, right, guys. Yeah. Always, uh, always fun. And I'm serious about the Dempsey book. Whether you speak or whether the book comes out, send us the link, and I'm sure they'd be interested. Uh, possible purchasers here. So I got, I got to get John McGraw in there. <laughs> I haven't got to that point where he would be in there. So <laughs> I want to also commend uh, Ted. Nice button, Ted. We will uh, see each other's uh, next Thursday with Eric Bickray. Have a good night. I'll hang around if anybody wants to talk or I'll show pictures and stuff like that. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody.